19 to 20. If everybody can stand up for the reading of God's word. I welcome everybody to Love First Church and those that are watching us via the live stream. We say to everybody, happy Memorial Day. Amen. Amen. Happy Memorial Day. And listen to me, we are not, we are not perfect, but I can tell you we live in a good country. Yeah. I'll say it again, we live in a good country. Yeah. You know, some of you may not believe what I'm saying, that, but I travel and we live in a good country. You know, and uh, God gave us a great republic. You know, we just have to pray that we keep it. Amen? Amen. 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 Where we can worship God. We thank God for our veterans. Do we have any veterans in the house? Anybody who's been in the military in the house? Or our own pastor, Thomas? Anybody? Oh, come on, somebody. Hey, put your hand together for our veterans in the military. Thank you so much for your service. Amen. We pray for those everywhere. Amen. I mean, even for military families who made the ultimate sacrifice, where maybe somebody in the home is not there anymore because they were fighting to keep us free. We pray for them to find joy on a day like this. Amen? Come on, somebody. Amen? A people that forgets their history or its heroes is a people without a future. You know, because the future is always laid in the blood of somebody else who was willing to take the extra mile. Amen? To keep the gates open. So we thank God for... So we honor today. Amen? We honor what? Veterans today. If you've got some veterans in your family, take them to, take them to dinner or lunch and pay for it. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's the least you can do. Hallelujah. Praise God. But uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, I'm gonna continue on this a subject that has really fascinated me. God has opened up a whole window for me. In this revelation on the order of Melchizedek, you know, this is something that I've never seen before. And, um, you know, but I met a woman of God who was taken to heaven in Zambia. This woman was taken to heaven. There's nothing weird about her. I'm telling you, I get around and I feel like I'm with Jesus. How many know when people have real visions of heaven, their character and their lifestyle will show it? I don't understand these people that talk to Jesus every day and their life is a mess. Come on, somebody. Every day he's talking to them. Come on, somebody. I'm like, at least he would tell you, clean your room up. Come on, somebody. <laughs> at least he would do that. You know, um, you know, and so she learned the Melchizedek order because of uh, a translation where God took her into the heaven and exposed her to the Melchizedek order as it is in heaven. That's how she found out. So she's, she comes into it from a mystical perspective. I come into it from a theological perspective. You see what I'm saying? And so it's very interesting. Uh, but when she began to talk about this altar of Melchizedek that God showed Jesus, Jesus took her Jesus to this altar of Melchizedek. And he said, this is where all of creation was made from. You know, this is why this altar affects everybody. I was thinking, altar of Melchizedek, that really got to me. And being the theologian, I have to find it in the Bible. And it was great to be able to find it. Amen? Amen. So today, I want to talk about the, I'm going to be, uh, so yes, last week, if you, didn't, if you didn't get my message for last week, get it, get the tape, because you need these two messages, amen? They are twin, they are twin messages, because they are a continuation on this unfolding revelation. Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? Yeah. Uh, and so last week, I talked about the altar of Melchizedek, the altar of what? Melchizedek. 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 And you know Melchizedek is the king of what? Righteousness. Is that right? Yeah. The altar of what? Yeah, so it's basically the order of a king of what? Righteousness. Amen. Where everything that's right about you comes from. Amen. Is, is that amazing? So, uh, but today God spoke to me that he wants me to talk about the elements of that order. The elements of the order of Melchizedek. Because if you need to know the elements so you can know what you can release from that place. What you can expect. What you can digest from that place. Are you catch what I'm saying? Amen? Amen? Turn to us say, neighbor, Amen. This, th th this Sunday, Sunday. we're going to go from knowing about the altar to feeding from the altar. Do you know, even, the, even in the covenant of Levi, one of the most important fundamental aspects of the altar is the priest ate from the altar. Yes. 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 
I, the only time they starved is the otter was starving. Then they starved. Interesting. Think about that. The only time they starved is if the otter had nothing. If the author has something, then they and their family never lacked anything. I want to understand God is an amazing God. He's showing you how the future is going to look like. I got what I'm saying. Now, the author of Levi could be starved. Could be what? Starved, starved because it depended on people supplying it. Wow. Yes. Yes. Mm. I hope you catch where I'm going with this. Yes. Okay, in the author of Levi, sometimes the priest would go on an involuntary fast. I mean, I've ever been on a fast, not because you want to fast, there's just no food in the house. Okay, you don't understand that kind of fasting. I had the several, come on somebody, amen. <laughs> I said, mama, where's the food? There's no food, just fast. Come on somebody. <laughs> That's called an involuntary fast. Okay. You know, and sometimes, so, but in the covenant of Levi, the priests were always, you know, come on somebody. The priests were always looking good. Because they ate from the fat and everything else and the meat that was on the altar. So the more meat on the altar, they felt pretty good. They then the families. They ate from the altar. That's the point. Amen. They ate from the what? The altar. Turn to your neighbor and say, Are you a priest? Why are you starving? Mm. Okay, we're going to find that why we have got some starving priest in here. Amen. Okay. So we're going to read Hebrews. We're gonna be, we're gonna, I'm going to count to three and as loud as you can. Let's read Hebrews 6 verse 19 to 20 with me and then you can take your seats. Beautiful people. I'm not going to be long today. Amen. We have a lot of people. We've got too many deserters today. Because it's Memorial Weekend, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> People all over the place, all over the road. But you know what? I thank God you came, to, you came to the house of the Lord. Okay, Hebrews 6, verse 19 to 20. Are you ready? Are you ready? So I'm going to ask that you give God your voice, your, ve your very best voice. As loudly as you can, as, at the count of three, read it with me. Amen? One, two, three, read. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul but sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Take your seats and God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Amen? So what is this telling us that, amen, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and what? Steadfast. Mm. Now that's, this is an amazing thing, because I'm going to be talking about what you eat from the altar. The elements first. So now I'm just going to, you know, uh, oh man, I'm loving this. I'm so excited because I'm seeing so many things here. Oh my God, it's so, so good. Yeah, man. Hmm. Which enters the presence behind the veil. Now, remember what I told you last week? That the veil here is not the veil. In the, old, in the Levitical tabernacle, the old covenant, they had a veil, an actual physical veil, a curtain that it, it was so thick. You know what I'm saying? It was so thick. I mean, the way they designed the curtain, you cannot take a scissors or a knife and cut through it. It was a very thick, thick Keaton, and the material was used was designed to be impenetrable eh, because it was designed to keep the people from the Shekinah presence of God that was behind the veil. Even the high priest had to go in this place with a lot of trepidation because even sweat could get you killed in the Holy of Holies. Interesting. Sweat. Because sweat is a production of the flesh. So God even told the priest, you can sweat when you're in the presence. So I'm telling them, tell them next to you, why are you sweating so much? Now tell them, stop sweating all this small stuff. You are in the presence. Do you know, Jacqueline, that they couldn't sweat? They were not allowed, the priests could not have sweat on their garments. 
because sweat is a symbol of the curse. God said, when you strive, you will sweat. So sweat is a symbol of striving, not resting. So God says, when you come, so if it's priest, can you imagine how, how, how you, I mean, man, come on somebody. If you, I'm the high priest, I mean, I'm checking everything. Come on somebody. Because, you know, the reality is, amen, we all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So I can imagine, you're going in there. I mean, you catch what I'm saying? It was, very, it was tremendous trepidation. But when Jesus died, the veil was rent. Is that right? The veil, two things happened when Jesus Christ died. The veil was rent, and the people who were in paradise, in paradise, because remember in the old covenant, paradise was next to hell. They shared a space. They only had a gulf between them, a border between them, so that those who were in hell couldn't bust a move <laughs> and enter this place. Are you catching what I'm saying? So Abraham and all the patriarchs had never gone to heaven. They died and they went down. That's what the Bible said. And they went down. Remember in the old covenant you find this expression, and they went down to their fathers. Because in the old covenant you didn't go up, you went down to rest. Because paradise was down. But when Jesus died, he came for paradise. Oh, come on, somebody. Pa paradise, he came. I mean, when Jesus came in, he made paradise on earth become paradise express. Come on, somebody. Amen. He says, boys, Abraham, are you guys ready? Noah, are you guys ready? Because we could have, come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Are you guys what I'm saying? Oh, come on now. This is exciting. Amen. Are you ready? Because we are about to go to a different place. I'm about to take paradise from here. And it's a, uh, that's what I'm about to take all of ca paradise captive. I'm going to take it all the way into heaven. You talk about Star Trek. Star Trek ain't got nothing on Jesus. What he did on that day. Come on somebody. Amen. I'm going to take everybody. But check this out. Before I take everybody. Um, I want to. I want to. How, how want you. If you like to. Those of, like, those of you who like to. You know. Come on somebody. You can walk in Jerusalem for a little bit. Have you ever seen? Have you, I mean, I've ever been on, on a cruise ship. Cruises, when they stop at an island, they say two hours. That tells me during the two hours, you become an islander for two hours. But you better come back to the cruise because the ship is going to leave. Well, that's what they did. He says, you know what? I tell you, you know what? I want to. Can you imagine all these dead people knocking on your door and trying to explain themselves? I'm your great, great, great mother. I, I died. To, what? I mean, you're, there were sort of people. I can just make big people. People are funny around death, you know. Are you catching what I'm saying? Can you imagine Jesus led those people? The Bible said they walked around Jerusalem. That it walked around what Jerusalem for a couple of hours before they were taken with him to heaven. I catch what I'm saying. Now we have something here. So the veil, I was saying this to say this. The veil no longer is that curtain in the temple because it does not exist. Is that right? It has been rent. But his veil is this that he's talking about behind the veil. Is the veil of the flesh. Touch yourself. And say, it's this. Say, this is the veil right here. Say, neighbor, believe me, this thing that you wash every day, buy a lot of chemicals for to make it look good, it is the one keeping you from the presence. That's why Paul says, to be absent from the bloody is to be present with the Lord. So you are your body, you are, me, so in other words, I, I can say it this way, you are one body away from God's presence, your body. That's how close. But the veil, you can see. All you see is the people in Phoenix and Timpy, but you don't know. But you're about to know how to live from the water. Melchizedek is a bypass. Have you heard it called bypass surgery? You know why it's called bypass? Because you're passing something that normally should be in the way. That's what a bypass surgery is. You think man knows bypass surgery and God does not know bypass? He will, I come on somebody. He wants you to bypass your flesh without dying. <laughs> so that what the flesh is hiding from you, you can begin to eat from now. Mm. And I'm going to show you this thing. Okay, so... Look at verse 20, he says, look at, look at verse 20, where the forerunner, now I mean a forerunner, you can't be a forerunner if you're running by yourself, is that right? 
A forerunner is a deposit on a troop that's coming. You can't be a forerunner and you are by yourself. A forerunner always is a representative. For instance, if we're going to all be going to Israel and we send somebody to go ahead of us to prepare our hotels and everything, what is that person? He's a forerunner, is that right? Is that sad for the forerunner to go and then we don't come? Jesus is a forerunner. He has entered. There's a lifestyle. He has entered for us. Watch this. He, there's a lifestyle. He has what? Entered for us. That means not even for himself. Why? Because Jesus already had that lifestyle before he came to the planet. There's nothing new for him. But we know we need it. We desperately need that lifestyle. So he enters for us. Okay? Even Jesus, now he wants you to know, nobody, nobody weird. <laughs> this is nobody weird. Even Jesus. So when we talk about Melchizedek, we are not moving away from Jesus. Hello? <laughs> Even Jesus, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 13 verse 10. I'm going to, where I'm going to show you the elements of this order and what you can eat from. It's time to eat from this altar. Otherwise, why be a priest at an altar and you don't eat from the altar? What are you talking about? Then you don't understand what the privileges of the priest is to eat from the altar they serve. That's why when David was hangry, when David was what? Hungry with his men, where did he get the bread from? Hmm. He went in the altar. He went where? Right into the temple, and he found some real nice bread. Consecrated bread. He was hungry. <laughs> His men were hungry. Are you get what I'm saying? And he took all the bread. And by the way, it had to be, it had to be a lot of bread because there was a lot of men with David. <laughs> it was not one piece of love. That was a lot of bread. Because men, come on, some men, men of war have a big tummy. He fed all of them. That means there was a lot of bread he took from that altar. Why would David do it? Why would David do it? The real question is why not? If David understood what, a, what the privileges of a priest is, he would know. If I'm a priest, then I have access to the altar. Now, to the altar. now let me just tell you something that's interesting about David. In this, in this whole story, you know, you know when this whole thing comes up, is Jesus' Jesus' disciples are eating, they're hungry, and they're eating corn. Man, corn has been corn has been around. They're eating corn <laughs> on Sabbath. So they just, so the Pharisees get so angry. They say, How how do, how, how do you let your disciples in, you know uh, 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 eat corn on, on the Shabbat? On the Shabbat, okay? And then Jesus said, well, for the same reason why David did it, he says, don't you say, don't you actually say it's not lawful for anybody who's not a priest to go and eat the bread that's consecrated to God? And they said, yeah, that's true. He said, well, then how would you explain David? Now, why is, what is Jesus trying to get to? He's trying to say, you already know that the priest can eat from the altar any time if he's a priest. Everybody say, if he's a priest. Say it with me, if he's a priest. Say, if he's a priest. Notice the if, the if. If is what? He can eat from the what? The altar. Is that right? Because what's on the altar is not consecrated against the priest. It's consecrated for the priest. Are you catching what I'm saying? So, David is saying, so, so just say, okay, guys, listen to me. If you, now here's what he's saying to them. Chill out. Don't think you are the only priests in Israel. Don't think that this Levitical priesthood where you have to be born a Levite to eat from the altar is the only priesthood there is. Because how do you explain if the Torah is right and Jesus never came to break the Torah, is that right? He came to fulfill the law, is that right? He said, okay, if I came to fulfill the law, I didn't come to break Torah. Okay, then how do you explain David? There's some, how do you explain something that's unexplainable by 
your own understanding. Because in your understanding, only somebody from the tribe of Levi, because my, you know my disciples are not from the tribe of Levi. That's why you're attacking them. So why are they eating, why are they t- eating food from the, on, on, on Sabbath? He says, but here's the thing. What about David? He says, David came and ate what? Consecrated bread, what, w- which is not lawful for a man who is not a priest to what? Eat. So what was Jesus trying to say? He was saying, if David was not a priest, why would God allow him to defile the altar by taking the bread and he lived to tell the story? So if God did not kill him and the Torah was not broken, then David must be a priest of another order. That order is what gave him the right to take the bread because he knew the bread was for him as a priest. So he could eat from the altar instead of starving because the altar I'm serving, on the, the, the altar of the God I'm serving, he's got food. He's got miracles. So I'm going to get me one. Why? Because I'm a priest at the same altar. Come on, somebody. Amen. Listen. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I hope you get this one. Amen. Because we're going to go from knowing there about the altar. I want you to eat from it. Because your life is not going to change if you keep looking at the altar of Melchizedek like something you go and look at a museum, that is, isn't that amazing? It doesn't help you. Because <laughs> if you're hungry, come on, some, I mean, how many, come on, some, I mean, if you're hungry and then you pass by a restaurant or, 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 or I mean, and you're passing, I mean, you're, you just keep looking at the food, you, you, you might get more hungry, but you don't get filled because you're not eating at the table. Look at, look at Hebrews 13.10. I'm going somewhere. I'm about to go to Hebrews. I'm, not, I'm going somewhere. Somebody say he's going somewhere. He's going somewhere. I'm not sure how to eat. What the elements of this order? What God wants you to eat from the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 13 verse 10. We have an order. My God. What do we have? What do we have? Jesus says, my people are destroyed for. The Bible says, my, no, okay. The Bible says that uh, you, you shall know the truth. You shall not. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? You shall know. What are you going to know? The truth. So if I know the truth, it's going to what? Set me free. Set me free. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right? So here's the truth. We have an altar. Say it with me. We have an altar. Make it personal. I have an altar. Watch this. Now, from which those who serve the, old, the tabernacle have no right to. To eat. Everybody said, no right, what? Notice the connection between the altar and eating. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Our Father, give us our daily bread. But praying that does not help you if you don't know where the bread is going to be provided on. You catching the point? You pray that prayer, and then you leave starving with a nice prayer on your lips because you don't know where the bread is provided at. And you don't know if you're right. You don't know you're right. You, we have an altar. The right of Hebrews says. Remember, he's writing this when the Levitical temple in Israel, the temple mount, was still going. Trust me, you know, just because Jesus had been dead, buried, resurrected, it did not even make a dent in the Levitical priesthood. They just, it was a blip. Uh, because to them, all they remember is a criminal we crucified. Because you are a believer, you, you see, sometimes because we are believers, we think everybody thought about Jesus the same way we did. No. In the Levitical temple, it was a blip. They killed the guy. He was a nuisance. <laughs> to them, he was a nuisance. We crucified the guy. They moved on. They moved on to the animals. So guess what? Uh, according to Josephus, 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. That means 70 years after the, the resurrection, after the resurrection, the Levites were just going on like Jesus never even came. They were just, people were bringing them all the steaks and the filet mignon. They were eating over there. And, and because they were Levites for that altar, they ate from that altar. But he's saying, but there's another altar that they have no right to. But you do. But if you have right to, they are eating at theirs. Why are you not eating at yours? Because you don't know you have an otter. And this is the otter. I want to show you what's at the otter. Because whatever's at the otter, the priest gets to eat. 
And just because you do not, give me First Peter 2 verse 9. Because some of you don't believe that you are a priest. So let me just do this very quickly. But you are ever, as a matter of fact, I'm going to count to three. And I want you to read this as loudly as you can. Man, I'm preaching good. I can give myself an offering. I really feel that stand. Somebody's life is about to change. One, two, three, read with me. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his last light. You are, someone say, I'm a royal priest. But I'm a priest. <laughs> so if you are a priest and you have an altar then, why are you living a lifestyle less than that of a Levite? Because the Levite knew if the altar is full, my family are not starving because the altar is full. And I feed from the altar of the God I serve. What's your altar? What's on it? What can you eat? That's what I want to go to. So, let's see what's on the altar. Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to show you what's around, what's on the altar, around the altar. Because that's what, that's whatever's around the altar is yours to feed on. <laughs> whatever's on the altar, you are a priest, you have the right to feed on what's on the altar. Hallelujah. I saw in the right hand... Of him who sat on the throne. I saw what? In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Continue. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its what? Seals. Continue. And, and, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, are you with me? And the, the root of what? David. The what? The root of David has what? Prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its what? Seven seals. Okay. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living what? creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Stood what? A lamb, a lamb as though it had been what? Slain. Remember what I told you last week? Whenever you find the lamb that's slain, that's bleeding, that's where the altar is, right? So it, the altar of Melchizedek is actually on the Father's throne. That's the point. Okay? Having seven horns and seven what? Eyes. I'm going to show you. All of this stuff is great. It's going to be good stuff. Which are the seven spirits of God. Seven what? Spirits of what? God sent out in all the earth. Which are the seven what? Spirits of God which are sent out in all the earth. Continue. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the four what? Say the four living creatures. And the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden what? Bowls. Golden what? Full of what? Incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Oh, there's a lot on this altar. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you are slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe, tongue, people, and what? Nation. And have made us what? Kings and what? Praise unto God. Where? At this same altar. And we shall reign. On the earth. We shall reign, not in heaven, on earth. So this altar, living from this altar is how you reign on earth. So if you're not eating from the altar, you are going to have a difficult, miserable life on earth. Because your rulership is based upon how much you eat from the altar of Melchizedek. So now, 
What can we eat from the altar? Ooh. Okay, can I give you? I'm going to give you a couple of things. If I don't finish to the Sunday, I'll continue. Amen. You get what I'm saying? But I'm going to give you a couple of things. Number one, hope. Somebody say hope. Hmm. Hope for the soul. Write it down. Hope for the soul. That's the first thing you eat from that order. One of the things you eat of this order. This hope we have as an anchor. This hope we have what? As an anchor for the what? So, why, why, would be, why would this be one of the most powerful things you eat from the altar? Hope. Because, understand something. Okay? You know why people are blowing their brains out today? It's because somewhere in the soul, something is fractured and they lose hope. You see, an anchor, if you've ever been to on the even Royal Caribbean or any of those cruises, when you get to an island because the ship is so big, it cannot get to the island. You know what they do? They throw an anchor. Is that right? They throw what? And the anchor makes sure no matter the turbulence in the water, when you come back, the ship will not be gone. Where's my ride? The ship is all... G- the anchor makes sure... That when you come back from your island visits, I don't know what I'm saying this, but some, but I just feel in my spirit, God, some, God is about to break somebody with a cruise. Receive it. Receive the cruise in Jesus' name. Paid for cruise. I just felt in the Holy Ghost to say it. Amen. But here's the thing, though. That big thing, are you guys what I'm saying? Ooh. Okay. Now, now no, notice an anchor for the an anchor for the what? An anchor for the what? The soul. An anchor for what? Because if the soul is not anchored, the turbulence of life can drive you away from God. Because the soul is your center for the will, the mind, and all those emotions. So if the altar does not feed you with hope, your soul will drive you away from God. Because the turbulence of the waters of life can drive you away. And you drift away. And we see people drifting away because they are not eating from the altar. And therefore they have no hope. I'm meeting a lot of hopeless Christians. Hope is gone. Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? You have to feel this hope. Mm. Wow. So one of the first things this altar of Melchizedek gives to you, that's what you have to eat as a hope. Hope. You know what the Bible says about hope? Hope does not make ashamed. For the love of God is shared abroad our hearts by the Holy Ghost. If you've got hope. And by the way, hope is also the element you need for your faith to work. Faith, faith is what? Substance of things what? Hopeful. So when you lose hope, you lose your faith. Because faith needs a hope to work. This anchor we have of the soul. Oh, but watch this, by the way. By the, but now the anchor... Is so long, watch this now, the anchor goes, you know, you know, the anchor, go to Hebrews 6 verse 19, that's where I am, just follow me, Hebrews 6 verse 19, watch this, the anchor, which is hope, is that right? <laughs> oh my God. This, this is it, this is the, amen? This is it, this, this is the, watch this, this hope, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and what? Yes. So, just, so, amen. So, this hope is what? Sure and what? Yes. Steadfast. That means it's to stabilize you. If you feed on it from the altar of Melchizedek, you will what? You'll be stabilized. It, it, because it's, it's a sure thing and it will stabilize you. And you know? well, watch this. This hope actually is drawing you. Into the presence behind the veil of your flesh. Oh, come on. See, that means when you lose hope, you lose the desire to enter his presence. 
That's why some of you don't even pray anymore because you have lost hope. Talk to God for what? Because you have lost hope. For what? The devil has driven you away. So this hope is an anchor and it goes right and it's drawing you somewhere. Hallelujah. So now I want every morning you wake up and say, Lord, uh, as, I come, as, I, as I go into this morning, I'm asking you to just, I, I, I'm here to eat. You know, you have to do it by faith. Fill my soul with the hope that comes from that altar of Melchizedek. That draws me right into your presence. And watch God begin to do amazing things for you in your heart. I got what I'm saying. Amen. The second thing at the altar that you eat from is the very presence of God. Is the very what? As a priest in the Melchizedek order, you're not supposed to have a dry life. Dryness is not your portion because the presence is one of the things you eat from the altar. The presence is right there. The presence what? Is right there. You should have a lot of presence of God around you. You should feel it. It should put a kick in your step. I got what I'm saying. What am I trying to say? If you get this revelation and, and, and make a demand on it, I promise you, I prophesy to you, the presence of God is about to explode on your life. I'm telling you. Come on, somebody. Amen. Man, listen to me. That's one thing I have in my life. I have the presence. Boy, I'm telling you, when you have the presence, it keeps you, baby. Ooh, listen to me. I got the presence. I got the presence. But I can eat the presence of God for you. Now, when I'm around you, you feel it. I share it because it's a lot of it. But when I leave, you need, you need to eat for yourself. You need to eat the presence for yourself. That means living on the altar of Melchizedek makes you hungry for the presence of God. How do I know that the mouse I'm feeding from that altar? You get hungrier for the presence of God. Hungrier and hungrier. Lord, I need more. Notice everybody who lives on that altar. You always know them. They love the presence. They, they live for the presence. They, they've got a lot of it. Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? Eat the presence. Face on the presence of God. It's on that altar. <laughs> Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? Guess who's on that altar as well? Jesus. That means if you're feeding from that order, Jesus longs to become very real to you. Jesus. You see, a lot of Christians, Jesus is a savior, but he's never, they never move from savior to friendship. You see, just like you can be friend with the Holy Spirit, you can be a friend with Jesus himself. <laughs> Jesus can become a friend. Do you know that? Not just a Lord, which he is to a lot of you, but Jesus can become. See, Jesus, let me tell you something. Are you catching what I'm saying? When you begin to live from this dimension, you actually can know the distinction between the Godhead. Yeah. You begin to descend their presence, differentiation, and you can know this is Jesus. He feels different. One, yet the way they manifest. The Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, I prophesy that the day of dryness in your life is over. Amen. I declare that right now. I curse the dryness in your life. I curse the spiritual dryness. I curse every spiritual dryness in your, in your life and I release the presence of God in those places. Are you catching what I'm saying? May you be driving home and just start crying because all of a sudden there is this, this presence of the God all around you. And you know, daddy is with me. God is with me. Papa is with me. Talk to me, somebody. This is what we as priests of the Melchizedek order have to live from. It's living from that. Are you catching what I'm saying? 
Are you with me, somebody? But let me give you one more. Now, 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 go to chapter 5. Chapter 5 of Revelation. I'll give you a couple ones, and then we're going to close this. Because I want to close it in the, I'm not calling the press team, because I'm going to close the service today very, very differently today. The way we're going to do everything. Today, I'm going to give you very specific instructions, because the altar is going to be hot. Okay, God is gonna want, he wanted me, told me when you preach this, activate it. Do an activation so people can learn how to feed that they live from the altar. The priest lives from the altar. That's what you are. Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know, God gives you both. You are a king and a priest, is it right? Amen? Amen. So if I were to say this, it's almost like this. Just check it out. A king lives from what he kills. Is that right? What he conquers. Are you, are you with me, somebody? I'm going somewhere with this. Okay? But a priest's life is much simpler. He lives from what's on the altar. This is what's happening with many of you. Wow. You're only living from your kingly side, so you have to work for everything. Wow. Because your priest's side don't know how to eat from it. So you think everything you must work for. So when you're trying to get a vacation, you start thinking, how many hours do I have to put in? And that's your first thought. And so you, you calculate, I need to put in 40 hours, 80 hours for the next three weeks, and there you go busting your brain. That's the, now, now, now God allows you because the, king, the king's space is the marketplace. So he lets you take your kingly sword, and he fights with you, and he gets you 80 hours, and you're on vacation. But by the time you get there, you are so tired, you're sleeping half of the vacation because you worked so hard just to get there. Because why don't you try? I've given you a double blessing. Why you just use one side of the blessing? Sometimes I don't want you to live from what you kill. I want you to live from what I have killed. That's the priest. Sometimes I just want you to eat from what's already prepared. That's why Jesus says some of you have been called to enter where you have bestowed no labor. But some of us are so laborious. We have to labor for everything. Jesus says you don't get it. There are so, you have been sent. Some of you have been sent to reap where you have no labor. Or do you know the, the, the priests never caught or raised any of the animals they ate? <laughs> Ooh, okay. I'll give you the last thing. Just for today. Then we'll continue, we'll continue with this series. I just feel as on this, we're going to continue on, this, on the elements of the, Melch- of the order of Melchizedek. Don't you just like this? Did you catch something out of this? Did you get a little bit out of this? Amen. Okay. Okay. Uh, Matthew, give me... Um, Give me uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. And uh, I want my guy on the keyboard. I want to show you. Remember, one of the, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 5, and around the altar of Melchizedek, we find so many things which I can get into today, but I want to get to one. One of the things we found there was, amen, a lamb, the lamb had what? Seven horns and seven eyes, right? I said, which are the seven what? Spirits of what? God. Which are the what? Seven what? Spirits of God. So these are one of the things you are supposed to be eating from if you live from that altar of Melchizedek. But let me tell you what the seven spirits of God are. So is that chapter 11? I don't know why we are in chapter 4. Chapter 11, verse 1 to 4. Amen. Okay. Amen. I want everybody to read it to me with me, verse 1 to 4. We're going to end here today. 1 to 3, read. There shall come forth a road from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh huh. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the Spirit of what? Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the what? The Lord. Okay? His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, not decide by the hearing of his ears. Let's just end it. But let's just go back. Let's just go back to verse 2. What? To verse 2 again. Did you see that? The Spirit of the Lord, what? Shall rest upon him. And the Spirit of what? Wisdom. Understanding. Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the what? The Lord. Have you seen in the Jewish homes how they have the menorah? Yes. This is where the menorah comes from. 
The menorah is, that's the menorah. It, it, by the way, the symbol of the Jewish, do you know the, 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 the symbol of Israel? When you go to the national emblem of Israel is the menorah. If you even go to the, to the Knesset, just right in front of the government house is a menorah. That's the national symbol of Israel. That, you know, but she let, let it, so essentially, the seven spirits of God deals with that. You know, we, 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 we are going to take more time later on that thing. I may spend some time. But let me just tell you that. Imagine those things are operating in your life. Wisdom. How many can use some wisdom in your life? How I many know some of the decisions you made could have been made differently if you had wisdom? There's some monies you lost you could not have lost if you had what? Wisdom. Because wisdom could have told you, come on somebody, amen. You don't go into business with freaking Freddy and come out right. <laughs> but you did, now you lost money, now you are angry with Freddy, but everybody should know. Everybody with wisdom would have known you don't do business with him. You know what I'm saying? My point is this. How many know your life could be different if you had wisdom? How many know some of the things you, some of the mistakes you made in marriage could have been avoided if you had what? Wisdom. What about understanding? How many just love to read the word of God and you understand it? Come on now. Imagine, imagine every chapter of the Bible, you pick it up and say, I got it. Jesus, I got you and I got it. How many would like to live that? But, but, but here's how many men Christians, read. they read the Bible. They, they are like, most Christians are like the Ethiopian eunuch. That's why they sleep around the Bible. Oh. Ask them, what are you reading? Oh, I'm in Isaiah. Do you understand? I don't know. Because it's like, how many would like to open it? Understanding. Understanding. Where you just understand what God understands. Can you feed on that? Can that change your life if that's what you are feeding on? Understanding? Understanding. Are you getting, what about counsel? That if you could speak a word one time and people get it. Counsel. Where you speak and people say, wow, I didn't think of you. How many people, how many lives can you save if you have the spirit of counsel? You have the spirit of what? Counsel. But instead of the spirit of counsel, you know what we end up with? The spirit of counseling. No wonder we are going, ha! Ah! You know, because counseling, amen, is giving people a bunch of options to see which one, which one works best for them. Counsel is simply fine knowing the way and saying, this is the way of working it. That's why Jesus changed everybody who came around him. Why? He didn't have counseling. He had no counseling sessions. That's why his life was easy. He had no counseling session. Who is he counseling? Over what? <laughs> you know, come on, somebody. No, he had the spirit of counsel. God's about to do that to you. What about power, might, power? Do you know the thing that we, need, we like the most in our life is power? Power to control your circumstances. Power to control your own life. Talk to me. You know why you go to work? You don't go to work because you really like money. You go to work because you like the power money gives to you. Amen. So really what you desire is power. God can give you power. <laughs> gives you power. What about knowledge? Knowledge. Can you imagine? Knowledge. Do you know how many people are millionaires now because they found the knowledge of just one thing in nature. And are you buying stuff from them because they found out that this plant, when you eat it, 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 it slims you down. Why didn't you, why didn't you find it? Now you buying there? Come on, somebody. What about the fear of the Lord? What, how many disasters would you avoid if you had the fear of the Lord? If you ate on the fear of the Lord. Think about it. Oh, by the way, the fear of the Lord is the only fear that delivers you from every other fear. Because if you fear the Lord, you fear nothing else. <laughs> That's deep. I need to write that one down. That's deep. I can't believe I'm the one who said it. Listen, if you've got the fear of the Lord, you fear nothing. Because the fear of the Lord 
The first thing the fear of the Lord does, it sets you free from every other fear except the fear of the Lord. That's what Jesus had. That's why he was not afraid of anybody or nothing because he already feared the Lord. So I'm fearing the Lord, why should I fear this? If I fear the Lord, why should I fear death? If I fear the Lord, why should I fear Pontius? If I, see, some of you, you have got so much fear, so afraid of a lot of things. The fear of the Lord. I tell you, lift your hands. Say, Heavenly, you know what? Today's God. Just lift your hands and just wave them to the Lord. Press him, come here. Because today we're going to do something different. Because there's an activation that's coming through this. Those that are watching, it's time for you to eat from the altar of Melchizedek. Don't eat from altars that make you feel hopeless. Don't eat from altars that make you feel like you are nobody. Don't eat from those kind of altars. It's time to feed from the altar. You have an altar with the Lord. So what we're going to do today is the way we're going to, my wife is going to come and do our tithes and offerings in a very different way today. Normally we bring the, the communion element here. I don't want to do that. I want you to listen, listen to me. The way we're going to do this is going to be very different today because we're going to go back. The prof- you, know, you know how the Lord changed my, I had a different message for memorial, but when I got here, the Holy Spirit changed my message when I heard them singing on the, the altar, on the altar. And so God said, continue the altar of Melchizedek. It's t- I'm still releasing that revelation. So we went to it. So what we want to do is, the way we're going to give our tithes and our offerings today, Pastor Camille, come and sing. By the way, give her the microphone, son. The way we're going to give our tithes and offerings today is we are going to give it in a very worshipful manner. We're going to come, we're going to open up. In other words, the offering is also the end of the service. And yet, because we're going to flow right into the ministry, God said, let my people come to the altar. And when you come here, whatever you are, come and eat something. If they, if, in other words, if, if, you, if there's something in your life that's missing, something you're crying to come here and say, God, when I go over there, I'm going to just give an offering or an, our tithe, but I want to I wanna, I wanna eat something. God, I need this. Listen to me. You come here and make a demand on the Lord because um, this altar is going to be hot. It's going to be light. This thing right now is connected with heaven. And you got what I'm saying? So then when it comes to the communion, whenever you are ready to go home, before you go home, or any time, or even in the procession of the worship, if you want to go there, take the communion, come back, and have it, it's going to be you and the Lord. I'm not going to lead anybody today. Okay? Or you can do it over there, go and get, it's all over there, uh, before you go home, or you can, I don't care how you do it, you find the way that works with you and Jesus, okay? Hallelujah. So when my, ask, my husband asked me to do the offering, the first thing that I heard in my spirit is, you cannot come into the presence of the Lord without a present. The problem is this, we know God as a father, but we don't know him as a king. You cannot come to a father as a son and treat him as a father if you don't know how to be a son. So you cannot come to a king if you don't know your kingdom citizen. But there are certain protocol in the kingdom, specifically when you're giving. You don't give to a king without a present. You know, Queen Sheba, when she had to go into the presence of Solomon, she gave 120 talents of gold, the best spices and precious stones. David, King David, when he was summoned by Saul, okay, Jesse had given him the donkey, donkey with bread and wine and a young goat to give to King Saul so he can minister to him with his harp. But he had to go before Saul with a present, with presents, the best presents they can give. But listen to this. When you give a king a present, the king gives you something in return. When the king accepts your gift, he gives you favor. So what happened to Queen of Sheba when he gave them the presents? The Bible said that the king gave her everything, all that she asked for and she desired. And she, she, when she left, she has more than what she gave. So that means you're telling me you gave her gold, spices, and gems? And she got more than that? That's the favor from the king. 
What did David get in return? David became the king's armor bearer and he ended up staying in the palace. The favor of the king. But we have Melchizedek. So when Abraham met Melchizedek in the valley of Chavez and gave him the tithe of all, Remember, on, on, we we're dealing with Melchizedek now. We're dealing with the altar. We have to understand that when we come to the Father as a king, we need to understand what we as a citizen of the kingdom will get in return. And we already know when we appropriate by faith that we are giving to the order of Melchizedek. So when our father Abraham, the very person that the Bible says we have to look into, came into the presence of a king. He said he's the king Melchizedek, so he's the king of righteousness. When and the high priest of the most high God, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and who is the most high God that possesses everything. So you're dealing with the high priest, I'm almost done, the high priest, who is the high priest of the God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand and who possesses everything. So when you're giving to Melchizedek, to the altar of Melchizedek, and when the king receives it, you're dealing with someone, the Most High God, who is the possessor of heaven and earth and who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And go, and then I'm going to go get, just get me 15.1. And this is what happens. He said, after all these things, after all these things, what are after all these things? After these things, the word, this is after the tithe and the receiving of the bread and the wine, which we're going to be doing today. Okay, so this is what I want you to really have a revelation. As a citizen of the kingdom, giving a present to our king. He says, do not fear, Abraham. I am your shield. I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Okay, so... When you give to the older of Melchizedek today, he's going to take away fear from you. He's going to be your shield. He's going to be your protection. And he will be a reward that she'll be very great. He is going to be your reward. And the last one is, please give me three and four. And I'm done. And Abram said, since you have given me no offspring to me and born in my house, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. What happens here? He, he, the barrenness. He's talking about having a child. He was barren. There was no child. And all of a sudden there's a child. So what I'm saying here right now, I'm going to repeat it again. When we give the best offering to our king today, the God Most High will deliver you, your enemies, into your hands. He is your possessor. He will take away fear from you. He will protect you. He will be your reward. And anything that is barren in your life right now will bear fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. As you come, I'm telling you, this is going to be... Listen, if you need an open, open envelope, raise your hand. Don't come empty-handed. Do something. If you don't have anything to give, if you have somebody next to you who doesn't have anything to give, just, you know, give them something. Let's give somebody something. We want to be able to come here because this order is going to be coming. You're going to come here. By the way, today, just you can give, but I want you to uh -huh. kneel, stand, whatever. This entire altar here is going to be consecrated today by the Lord. Remember, oh. one of the things that, that was at the altar of Melchizedek in heaven was the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the what? The saints. I believe today the prayers of the saints are getting answered on Memorial Day. On this Memorial Sunday, you, the prayers of the saints are being answered. Amen. As you come here, make a demand on the, on the altar. Eat from the altar. When you walk out of here, I, I, oh God, I, I, I double dare you to live with something from the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Come on, somebody. So, guys, are you guys, are you guys ready? On the altar. So, as you are singing, you can come anytime. Today is different. Amen. And then make sure, amen. Hallelujah. As for that, just make sure it's opened up, Pastor, on the altar so people can go and serve themselves anytime.